Well, good morning and welcome to Fizz Fun Interactive Sunday School. And this is our last issue. I do that with mixed emotions. Uh, first of all, I have really enjoyed doing this and I've enjoyed getting feedback from many of you. And I appreciate your appreciation of these uh, Sunday School lessons. Uh, both of the churches that I serve feel that it's time to get back to Sunday school in person. And uh, so we're going to discontinue the interactive Sunday school by internet. Uh, however, if you'd like to have my thought for the day, uh, which I do five days a week, uh, be sure to drop me a note and I'll make sure that you get added to my YouTube notifications for that thought for the day. And if you'd like to have some help with your Sunday School lesson, whether it's the uh, Exploring the Bible series or some other series, I'd be happy to help you with that. So just drop me a note and let, you, let me know, and we'll work out a way that I can help you with your Sunday School lessons if you're a teacher or even if you're a student and just want to look a little bit more in depth into what the lesson is. In any case, this is the last issue of Fizz, uh, barring any other unforeseen difficulties and today we're in the synoptic gospel of Luke. Synoptic means that there are uh, other passages in other gospels that are the same event and we also know this is Dr. Luke which is the only non-apostle who's writing but he's writing with great authority because he's writing based on eyewitnesses. He writes to the Greek mindset and the emphasis on God's grace. This is the largest of all of the four Gospels with 25,640 words. And we know that today's episode, which is titled Willing, it comes from Luke 22, verses 41 through 53. It's written in A.D. 30, and uh, it deals with the Thursday to Friday event. When I say it was written in A.D. 30, it's written about the times of the events of A.D. 30. Uh, actually, Luke wrote around A.D. 62 to 64. Uh, but it's a Thursday or Friday event of the last week before the crucifixion and resurrection. And I think the best way to get started, as we have been for the last many weeks, is to take a look at ten questions that you should look for the answers in the scriptural text and through your own personal study. So we're going to take a look at ten questions. You can stop and start this video so that you can stop it now and uh, after the 10 questions and uh, do as much research as you want to and then come back and we'll pull apart today's text and take a look at the answers to the 10 questions. Well, here are your 10 questions for this coming Sunday's lesson, May the 2nd on Luke chapter 22, verses 41 through 53. In any case, here are your 10 questions for the lesson called Willing from Luke 22, verses 41 through 53. The first question is, what are the parallel passages for this Luke 22, 41 through 53? That means, what other passages in Matthew, Mark, and John now, are there that cover the same event? Question number two. Where was Jesus for this event? Geographically, where was Jesus for this event? Question number three. What are the advantages of personal versus corporate prayer? What are the advantages of personal, that's private, versus corporate, that's in a group praying out loud, prayer. What are the disadvantages of personal versus corporate prayer? Question number four. What would you say was the most important words of Jesus' prayer in this event? What would you say are the most important words of Jesus' prayer in this event? Question number five. Why should verse 43 be a great encouragement to us? Why should verse 43 be a great encouragement to us? Question number six. 
what special additional information did you get from the parallel passages in Matthew, Mark, and John? What special added information did you get when you looked at the parallel passages? Question number seven. Verse 47 and 48 reveal a part of humanity of Christ. Verses 47 and 48 reveal a part of the humanity of Christ. What did it reveal about Christ's humanity? Question number eight. Verse 49 and 50 reveals a spiritual truth. What would you say it is? What would you say is the spiritual truth of verses 49 and 50? Question number nine. Verse 51 reveals two important attributes of God. Verse 51 reveals two important attributes of God. That's Jesus in the flesh. What are they? What are the attributes that are revealed to us in verse 51? Verse 53, the last question, verse 53 teaches us what about darkness? What is the lesson that we learn about darkness in verse 53? For extra credit, what should we always remember and apply to our lives based on this event? What should we always remember and apply to our lives from this event? Well, those are your 10 questions. I hope that you'll have fun researching them. I hope that you'll have fun looking at the parallel passages and seeing the additional information that's available there and those parallel passages. And I hope you will drop me a note and let me know what uh, you'd like to see in the way of thought for the day or, or what you might like to have some help with on Sunday School lessons. And particularly, if you want some help on Sunday School lessons, let me know what series you're studying. Uh, let me know what Lifeway series or what books you're studying uh, in your Sunday School, and I'll be glad to uh, give you some additional help in those lessons. But this is definitely one of those lessons that you need to read uh, before the uh, uh, material that you've been assigned and after. And it's very, very important that you look at the parallel passages of this particular text. Uh, you'll never get all that you need to get out of this lesson without doing that. So let me encourage you, if you've not already done that, to stop the video and uh, read your parallel passages. But also read some of the chapters leading into this section of Scripture and leading out of it so that you get a full context. Let's take a look at the uh, Scripture text that's been assigned for this lesson first. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. And being in agony, he was praying very fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down on the ground. When he rose from the prayer, he came to his disciples and found them sleeping from sorrow. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not enter into temptation. While he was still speaking, behold, a crowd came, and the one called Judas, one of the twelve, was preceding them, and he approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When those who were around him saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus answered and said, Stop, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and the officers of the temple and the elders who had come against him, Have you come out with swords and clubs as you would against a robber?
while he was while I was with you daily in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this hour the power of darkness are yours. In answer to question number one, I think that it's very clear that there are parallel passages for this section of scripture. You'll find them in Matthew 26, verses 30 through 56, and Mark chapter 14, verses 26 through 52, and John chapter 18, verses 1 through 12. Luke seems to be the one that has the least amount of information of all of these accounts. Well, perhaps John has a little less, but nevertheless, it's really helpful to be able to read these other three accounts of this particular event so that you get the full impact that this passage has. So let's pull it apart one verse at a time or a couple of verses at a time and see how much we can get out of it and let's see if we can answer all of the questions that we had in our 10 questions. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. In last week's lesson, the last time we saw Jesus, he was in the upper room having the Passover meal with his disciples. Now he's traveled across the Kidron Valley, and he's gone back up into the Mount of Olivet, and he's gone into the Garden of Gethsemane. And we uh, certainly need to know exactly where that is. And that was our next question on our list of 10 questions. Where was Jesus for this event? So let's take a look at our map. In the top right-hand corner of this particular map, you can see an arrow pointing to the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, which is on a approximately one-mile ridge called the Mount of Olivet. And you'll see also that it's about one and three quarter miles from Jerusalem and about two miles away from Bethany. So that gives you an idea of how easy this was for Jesus to retreat to this place, this quiet, peaceful place where he could have special time with his disciples and a special time of prayer. Uh, it was supposed to be a beautiful garden with lots of olive trees, although the exact location is really not known. Now it says that he separated himself from his disciples and that brings us to our question number three. What are the advantages or disadvantages of corporate versus personal prayer? And obviously there's a time and a place for both. Uh, in corporate prayer, uh, we often have a tendency and a temptation to pray for those that are listening. Uh, that's not a good thing. We're supposed to be talking to God, not to the people that are listening. However, uh, corporate prayer often is an encouragement to those that are listening. Corporate prayer is often uh, a place that we can petition for those others that are in our corporate prayer uh, area. Uh, and personal prayer, of course, is just that. It's between us and God, not necessarily anybody else's business, and often uh, not best to speak in front of others some of the things that we want to speak. Uh, but we certainly can focus on God as we pray when we have personal prayer time. And we don't have to pray out loud. God knows our prayers, even if they're not spoken. Uh, but he does know when we're focused on him. I particularly like uh, something that we learned at a conference on prayer one time, and that is that we need to seek God's face and not necessarily his hand. Let me say that again for you. When we pray, sometimes it's good for us to focus on God's face and not his hand. That means that we should focus on who God is and our desire, as Jesus desired here in the garden, to seek his will for our lives and not always petition him for things uh, where we want him to give us something from his hand, uh, but rather to seek who God is, his face. That brings us to question number four. What would you say was the most important words of Jesus' prayer? And uh, I think that most of you would agree that uh, Jesus' prayer and the emphasis on his prayer was that he wanted this cup to pass from him. But more than that, he wanted God's will to be done, even if it meant the cup wasn't going to pass from him. 
And when we pray, we need to understand that God's will and his way is always better than our own. And we should always add into our prayers that we want his will and not necessarily just our petition. Uh, certainly we can all learn from that. The other thing I want you to notice as we go into verses 43 through 46 is that Jesus was doing spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare is often done in prayer. And you'll see the agony and the pain that Jesus is going through in the spiritual warfare as we look at verses 43 through 46. Now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. And being in agony, he was praying very fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. When he rose from the prayer, he came to his disciples, found them sleeping from sorrow, and said to them, Why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Question number five says, uh, verse 43, uh, what was the great encouragement to us? And... Uh, I think you probably noticed that not included in Matthew, not included in Mark, and not included in John, is that an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. Aren't you encouraged that God has his angels who not only watch over us, but who are there to strengthen and encourage us? How many times have you felt God's presence? Maybe you didn't see an angel like Jesus saw, but maybe you felt God's presence as you prayed and you knew that his angels were watching over you. It's a great encouragement to me and I think it probably should be to you as well. I want you to also notice that the drops of sweat were not blood, as some have said, but they were large like drops of blood. And they certainly were large because of the spiritual warfare that was going on between what Jesus would like to have happened versus what he knew must happen and how he had to fulfill his father's will. And then also I want you to notice that here in Luke, we're missing the fact that he went back to his disciples three times. Uh, we have just one time listed here. And of course he rebukes them for their sleep. But I think it's important for us to remember when we look at the other parallel passages, we probably won't be quite as hard on the disciples as we would be if we read only the Luke account. Their exhaustion was from the pressures and the times that had gone by and what they had been told by Jesus at that Passover meal. They were thinking about so many things, betrayals, uh, the fact that he would cause them to recognize the real greatness doesn't come from uh, perhaps outward evidences of a man's life and so many things to think about and to pray about it's no wonder the disciples were exhausted from emotional strain and trying to figure out all of the things that were going on but I want you to know he also reminds us that prayer is a wonderful way to keep from falling into temptation. Let's take a look at our next verses. While he was still speaking, behold, a crowd came, and the one called Judas, one of the twelve, was preceding them, and he approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Question six was, what special additional information did you get from the parallel passages? And there's so many things. If you read a little bit ahead of the passage of Scripture, read a little bit after the passage of Scripture, and then you read the parallel passages, uh, you got an awful lot of extra information. And so we'll cover some of it now and some after we read the next verses. Uh, but certainly... Uh, how they got to the garden, uh, having left Jerusalem and coming through the Kidron Valley. 
Uh, we certainly see the angel, which uh, uh, we needed to know about. We, we didn't need to uh, uh, skip over the fact that Jesus had prayed three times, uh, and each time he would find his disciples sleeping. Uh, we wouldn't have found out about the fact that he left some of his disciples, probably eight of the disciples, further away from him and then took uh, his inner circle of Peter, James, and John uh, to within a stone throw of where he was praying and that he would come back to them uh, as well and find them sleeping. And uh, certainly the betrayal of Judas, which was coming with this throng of people, uh, was forecast before when they were having the Passover meal and when Jesus gave them a new covenant in his blood. Uh, we see so many things uh, by reading these parallel passages and by being sure that we read the full context and the things that happened before this and the things that happened after this give us so much more insight into this passage of scripture. Certainly as we see Judas coming, we see the question number seven, uh, what reveals the humanity of Christ uh, and that's this betrayal. Ever been betrayed? It's a terrible feeling. Uh, Matt, maybe you were betrayed at work. Maybe you were betrayed by a mate. Maybe you were betrayed by a child. Uh, whenever you're betrayed, it's a terrible thing. And you can see the humanity of Christ. And you can almost feel his pain as one of the 12 that he had poured his life into for 30 pieces of silver had betrayed him. And he was going to do it even a worse way in that he was going to betray him with a kiss, which was typically a ceremonial kiss. This is not a kiss of passion. This is a ceremonial kiss of greeting, a warm friendship, uh, which was practiced in those days. To have this warm friendship fake kiss given so that those that were following Judas would know which one Jesus was in the dark of the garden and the confusion of the twelve being all present, betrayed by a kiss. The humanity of God, because he understands our emotions, not just our actions, but also our feelings, our emotions, our motives, all of those things he understands. And it's revealed to us here once again when we see Jesus saying to Judas, do you betray me with a kiss? Let's take a look at our next verses. When those who were around him saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear the other gospel accounts we wouldn't have known about the warnings to Peter about how he was going to deny Christ three times we wouldn't have known who it was that said should we fight with the sword we wouldn't have known that it was Malchus uh, the uh, slave of the high priest we wouldn't have known all of the details of uh, Jesus uh, touching Malchus's ear uh, there's so many things that we learn by reading these other gospel accounts. And uh, certainly we would have missed the size of the crowd and the fact that they were not only Jewish leaders and the guards from the Jewish court, but they were also Romans that were coming. And they were coming with clubs and swords and with lanterns and all kinds of uh, uh, weaponry that they could use against Jesus and his disciples. Uh, but have you ever had a time when you were reading scripture and God spoke to you? I mean, really specifically spoke to you. And he spoke to you in a lesson that you'd never heard preached, never heard taught, and never had encountered before in any kind of material. And it was like a brand new revelation to you. And you said to yourself, wow, that's neat. Well, it's this section of scripture that that happened to me. And I've probably preached it now for some 40 years. 
So you may have heard it. You may have heard it from me. You may have heard it from other preachers. You may have read it in a book. And God says there's nothing new under the sun. It probably was out there before I saw it, but I saw it here. And I only saw it here because I had read the parallel passages. So let's take a look with these next couple of verses at a spiritual lesson that God showed me that I had never seen except by his revelation to me. And let's see if it's new to you as well. If not, that's fine. I'm glad that you were revealed uh, this truth from some other source. Uh, but I want you to understand first-hand revelations are so much more exciting than second-hand revelations. And I hope someday God speaks to you where you've never heard it before, you've never read it before, but God reveals it just to you. Let's take a look at the next couple of verses and then I'll try to bring that whole point through. But Jesus answered and said, Stop, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Okay, here it is. I studied these passages of Scripture years ago. And I dug back and forth between the different gospel accounts of this event. And I recognized that somebody had said, Should we fight? And after examining all of the accounts of this event, I found out that Jesus never answered the question. Oh, he stopped them after it was over, uh, but he never answered the question. Uh, then I looked back and forth and I saw that it was Peter. Remember, uh, they had been asked prior to this, do they have any swords? Now there were 11 of them still left. And they found two swords, and Jesus said, that's enough. That may have planted the idea in their, eye, their eyes that uh, perhaps they were going to have to fight it sometime. But only two swords for 11 disciples. Nevertheless, I, I looked at the fact that it was Peter who probably asked the question. It was Peter that had the sword, obviously one of the two swords. It was Peter that didn't wait for an answer from Jesus. It was Peter that swung at Malchus's head to try to cut it off. It was Malchus that probably tipped his head to the side to try to avoid the sword. And when he did, it made Peter's sword slide over the side of Malchus's head and take off his ear. Now, a bloody ear uh, taken off probably right even with the head. Malchus probably screaming in pain. Jesus not only rebukes Peter and the disciples for wanting to fight, but Jesus reaches over with his hand and he touches Malchus's ear and heals it completely. No more fighting. This needs to be. You didn't wait for my answer to whether or not we should fight. And I sat back in my chair and I said, Pete Vandeway, how many times have you asked God a question and not waited for an answer? And as a result of not waiting for an answer, you charged ahead of God and you did something that you hadn't waited for an answer. And as a result of charging ahead of God, you made a mess of things. Just like Peter charged ahead with the sword and made a mess of things. Now watch this. And Jesus had to clean up the mess that you made because you didn't wait for an answer. Have you ever asked anything in a petition? Or have you ever asked anything of God, not waited for an answer, charged ahead, and then Jesus had to clean up the mess you made? That's what happened with me. There's another side issue that I thought about that really makes me chuckle when I think about it. And you probably say this is a rabbit run. And yes, it is a rabbit run. When I was a teenager before I was saved, I think I was probably a junior high school student. Matter of fact, I'm sure of it. I was a junior high school student. 
woodshop was one of those required classes when I was in junior high school. And nobody liked our woodshop instructor. <laughs> Uh, there wasn't a very big budget for our, our wood shop, and uh, he would make us sand a piece of wood until it was probably half the thickness of when we first cut out the piece of wood. Uh, that's an exaggeration, of course. But nobody liked him because we knew that he was a perfectionist, and we didn't have a lot of pieces of wood, and we didn't get projects finished very fast because we'd take it up to him, and he'd say, sand it some more. Don't put the varnish on it yet. It's not ready for varnish yet. Well, nobody cared for this fellow, and we called him Uncle Benny. And he would always come to wood shop every day in his white lab coat, bright white. It went from his collar, and it had a nice collar on it, buttons down the front, and it went all the way to his knees. Well, one April Fool's Day, I decided I would have some fun with Uncle Benny. And I got a little water pistol, and I filled it with invisible ink. Now, if you don't know what invisible ink is, it's, it's ink that you see, and when it dries, the ink black disappears. I'm not quite sure how that works. Somebody with it's good at chemistry, could probably tell you how that works, but you, I think you can still buy it today. It's called invisible ink. It looks black in its liquid form. It looks black while it's still wet, but when it dries, it completely disappears and does no damage. Well, I filled my little water pistol with invisible ink, and on April Fools, having told all of the other guys in the shop, uh, that I was going to take and spray Uncle Benny's beautiful white smock, his lab coat, with invisible ink. And so everybody waited patiently while I went up to Uncle Benny, pulled out of my pocket my pistol filled with invisible ink, and sprayed it all over the front of his beautiful white lab coat. He looked down in horror at his beautiful white lab coat covered with black ink, grabbed me by the shoulder and marched me to the principal's office, which was up a floor of stairs and down a hallway. And he marched me into the principal's office and he said, this young man did this to my coat. And he looked down and all of the ink was gone. <laughs> You can imagine his embarrassment when he looked at his lab coat, thinking he was showing the principal all of the ink that I had sprayed all over his coat, and there was nothing there to show the principal. Well, it's funny now, but it wasn't funny then. <laughs> but you can imagine, as I reflected on this story of Peter, taking and asking, should we fight? cutting off the ear of Malchus, Jesus healing it back perfectly, how the Roman soldiers and how the guards from the uh, Jewish folks' uh, synagogue couldn't take Malchus back and say, look what Peter did. We need to crucify him as well. Because when they went back with Jesus, Malchus's ear was perfect. God could heal it perfectly, and he did. He cleaned up Peter's mess, and there was no evidence and no way that they could blame Peter for having done anything in a way of a battle of cutting off Malchus's ear. Well, let's take a look at our next verse. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and the officers of the temple and the elders who came against him, have you come out with swords and clubs as you would against a robber? While I was with you daily in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this hour and the power of darkness are yours. And that brings us to question number nine in verse 51. It reveals two important attributes of God. Jesus in the flesh, if you will. And what are they? 
compassion, power, divine, peace, all of those things that he wants are revealed in this particular episode, this event. We can see how God's compassion, we can see how God's power, his healing ability, his desire for peace for all. And even when his enemies come, he lives out what he teaches. He says to love our enemies. And we see also his compassion and his understanding of Peter, his frailty, his fact that he's going to deny him, his charging ahead, putting his foot in his mouth, moving ahead of asking a question and then not waiting for an answer. Oh, we see so much about God's attributes here in verse 51 and through this particular event. And question number 10 in verse 53 teaches us what's about darkness. Well, darkness is a place for evil to occur. There's nothing evil about darkness per se, but we certainly know that God contrasts his light and light in the world with darkness. We see all through scripture uh, about Satan in his darkness. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. Colossians 1.13 talks about how Satan is represented in darkness and how he works in darkness. And we know that many times when we're tempted and we do evil, uh, we do it in darkness. Uh, we do it because we think nobody can see that God sees, even in darkness. And so he says to them, you did this in the power of darkness. I want you to also notice that we don't have it in Luke, but we do have it in the other gospel accounts. God recognizes that the spirit often is willing, but the flesh is awfully weak. That's encouraging to me. When I fail him, when I fail to do something he asked me to do or fail to have done something that I know I shouldn't, it's good for me to know that he understands that the spirit's willing, but the flesh is also often very weak. Then finally, I ask you for extra credit. What are the ways that you can apply this to your life? And I hope you saw a lot of ways to apply this event to your life. You see, Bible study is not just for head knowledge. You might be able to go into a game show and add, answer all kinds of trivia questions. Who was the person whose ear was cut off? And you may feel really proud that you could say, I know it was Malchus. But I want you to know that it's application that God wants. To betrayal, the pain of it, the asking without waiting for an answer, the making a mess by charging ahead of God, uh, the testing of our faith as these disciples had their faith tested, the power of God, the presence of his angels, the compassion of God and the study of the scriptures for personal truths. Sometimes a revelation you got from no other way except God speaking to you. You didn't hear it. You didn't read it. But there it was, a truth just for you. Isn't God good? All the time he's good. And I hope that you've enjoyed this last of the Fizz classes. And I hope that we'll be able to study the God's Word together in person. And I hope that you'll write me a note. Let me know if there's anything else I can do for you or anything else you'd like me to study uh, and present to you through my thought for the days. God bless you. And I hope that you're able to go back to worship in person. And I hope you'll stay safe. God bless. Mm -hmm.